Welcome back, everybody. My name is Stephen Mazey. As, as Roger said, I teach politics and law at Bard High School Early College Manhattan. And I am teaching an additional class. I'm privileged to be teaching an extra class right now uh, to Bard High School Early College students around the country. Uh, they are here on campus, and they're on their way back to this session. Uh, but we are learning on Thursday afternoons in a course called uh, what is it called? Rage, Reason, and Politics, which is obviously tuned to this conference. Um, and we have done some preparation for these, uh, for the speakers that we've been hearing. Uh, and we're, it's just lovely to be able to gather in person with you. And I want to thank Roger for, for including us and for all the stimulating conferences over all the years that we've been coming. Um, I'm delighted to moderate uh, this session with Colin McGill, who is a founder of a digital platform called Polis, which you probably are only hearing about right now. Um, but it is a platform which is changing the world quietly. Uh, it's introducing a new mode of democratic politics in countries including Taiwan, the UK, and Canada. Over the past two days, we've been discussing many reasons why social media may threaten democracy, by spreading rage and lies and hatred rather than reason and light and knowledge. This session most squarely confronts uh, Roger's question that he left us with yesterday, which is, can democracy be saved? Can reason be salvaged? We're going to explore a different kind of social media platform, one that strives to promote consensus and solve problems rather than spur division. Polis, this platform is, I think, well-named. Of course, it harkens back to the Greek city-state where democracy was born. Uh, and the simple, stripped-down interface of the platform feels to me a little bit like a 21st century version of an Athenian assembly, where every citizen speaks and votes directly rather than through agents or representatives. In some ways, Polis, the platform, is a market improvement on Polis the Greek city-state in that it does not exclude vast categories of people uh, like women and the unpropertied and slaves and resident aliens. Uh, but as we learn about polis from Colin, I'm going to be thinking about two other Greek words, uh, which are familiar to anyone who's taken an introductory political philosophy class, uh, doxa and episteme. Doxa is opinion, whereas, uh, whereas uh, episteme is knowledge or true opinion. Plato via Socrates was no fan of mere doxa. He thought it's no substitute for knowledge, and most Socratic dialogues were built on demonstrating how faulty most conventional thinking is. Uh, so the Socratic path from doxa to episteme is paved through reasoned deliberation. And so as we learn about polis, we should ask whether and how um, an online platform like this can um, facilitate that deep, patient endeavor of reason dialogue, uh, rather than just reproducing and amplifying a range of opinions, a chaos of doxa on a scatter plot. Uh, we should ask if there are trade-offs when we make politics too gamified, too easy, too frictionless. So to what degree do polis, do polis conversations promote critical thinking and reflection and actual dialogue? rather than just a lot of clicking. Um, and thinking back to President Botstein's comments today, uh, are there limits to a disembodied discussion? We will all have a chance to engage in one of those discussions, although in embodied form here in this auditorium in a little bit. I, just to test out Polis last week with my students, I initiated a conversation about the central premise of Maisha Cherry's book, the Case for Rage, this wonderful book that we discussed yesterday. And you'll all get a chance to add your voices to that conversation and get a sense of how Polis works. Before we get to that, though, Colin. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that, that introduction. <clears throat> and thank you all for being here and for the organizers for having us. Whether or not 
humanity builds new forms of deliberation may determine the next generation of democratic outcomes. This is a pursuit that our team has been working on for over a decade, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to talk through the platform as a tool, and then also, as Stephen alluded to just a moment ago, the platform uh, as a deliberative method and perhaps an experience as well for all of us uh, to, to have together. So first, Polis is an open source platform, uh, and the intention is to efficiently gather and make meaning of perspectives at scale using machine learning. And I'm gonna talk about each bit of that first. The first part of this statement, if you're unfamiliar with the word open source, it refers to code which is open on the internet. It's available to anyone to download. It's available to anyone to modify and to change. It's available to anyone to audit, to take and make their own, and to deploy and control the data and the flow of data for. Uh, this has meant that the adoption of the tool uh, has spread into governments themselves, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end, uh, in a way where they can control the data. The public itself can control the data, uh, which is, is a significant uh, both in the auditability and, and transparency of the algorithms used uh, and in the control of the data uh, after it has been produced. The purpose of the tool uh, is to efficiently gather, and that word is significant in the sense that we want to do this quickly with the minimum amount of interaction per person, and that gets into some of the algorithms which have been chosen, which we'll discuss, uh, and making meaning of perspectives at scale. That is to say, if we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people who want to engage in participatory democracy and deliberation, are our democracies preparing for success? To offer a specific example of the current process in regulatory processes in the United States, for instance, in the case of genetically modified organisms, uh, regulatory action has been taken in the United States uh, on that topic and on many others uh, through government agencies in which sometimes over a million statements have been submitted in free text form. That is to say, people show up and type into a comment box and press submit and they go into a long list and we as a public and they as a government are expected to make meaning of that. That is participation on the order of hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Is it meaningful? Is it efficient? Does it scale? We have a baseline which is sufficiently not working that we don't necessarily consider that an organ of deliberation in democracies at present, but it is. And we'll talk about the comparison to some of the present structures, both domestically and internationally, uh, which have been potentially implicated by changes in online democratic systems, deliberative systems. And the last bit, I'm going to try to give you the briefest overview into machine learning, if it's a new term to you. Uh, this is uh, artificial intelligence, perhaps you've heard it as, in, uh, or perhaps you, you know it uh, as, as um, you know, intelligent systems, or cybernetics, uh, perhaps in, in, in previous form. Uh, we had a previous speaker, uh, William Davies, who was uh, speaking about cybernetics as well, and the roots of, of artificial intelligence and anti-aircraft fire. Uh, fertile, fertile room for discussion in where the technology of machine intelligence sensing has come from and where it may go and be applied. Polis as a technology has its origins in movements like Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring. These were an initial imp Im uh, impulse and impetus as a technologist and as a, uh, uh, as a motivated citizen I have been passionate personally uh, about the challenges specifically to groups of citizens attempting to coordinate their behavior at scale in democracies. We saw that at work in the Arab Spring and in Occupy Wall Street. Social media is good, Twitter is good for mobil mobilizing citizens and getting people out into the streets. Uh, Twitter was not as good for writing constitutions. So if we have lots of people who are motivated to participate, and we do have lots of issues and lots of different dimensions to a discussion over time, we have lots of competing interests uh, and lots of, of positions that, that emerge from those interests and values. Can we reconcile them efficiently and scalably? Can we prepare for success in short? Can we involve many more people in democratic decision making in our democracies? I'm going to show you the tool 
because since we built something, it's significant to start from what it is that we're actually proposing and presenting and what is being used ab both domestically and abroad. It looks like this. The bottom part, I'll start with here, where it says share your perspective, is a text field. Open text can be submitted here. You'll have an opportunity to do that in a moment as we go to a URL. Uh, on a, on, you can do this on your mobile phone from your seat in a moment at the end of this section of the talk uh, and discuss Professor Cherry's book. Submitting a statement is not required. And you may want to vote a little bit before you submit a statement because the ideas that you had may have already been shared. The thing which is required to participate in Polis is to agree, disagree, or pass after some consideration on statements which have been submitted by others. The fact that everyone can do this in parallel means that everyone in the room has an opportunity to engage with, in a structured and constrained way, the ideas of everyone else uh, that have been submitted. This is, in short, the system. This system produces a data structure uh, which is a matrix. This is significant from uh, the machine learning algorithms which are used to uh, consider this, uh, this, this submitted data uh, because you can consider that every row in this matrix is a participant, some, someone who has submitted an agree, disagree, or pass, and every column is a statement. Every column is a statement. The spreadsheet, you could think of it as a giant spreadsheet, will grow as new statements are submitted and as new people enter the conversation and vote. And you can think of the results as either a one, zero, or negative one, a one for agree, a zero for pass, and a negative one for disagree, or an empty cell for did not see it, did not vote on it. And I share this because it's, while it is a uh, rather machine compile uh, kind, of, kind of slide, um, what it represents is it represents not the raw text field on a site where we just dump in a bunch of text and walk away, um, but it represents not only what everyone had to say, which is that raw text field, but also what everyone thought about what everyone had to say. It expands the kind of usual comment field that you're used to seeing uh, into something that can be referred to as an opinion matrix, which is something that can be analyzed by algorithms. The particular method uh, has been coined, this is a, a, a term which was coined by uh, Matthew Salganik, Princeton University, uh, in a book called, uh, well, he wrote about it in a paper and then also in a book called Bit by Bit. Uh, we were happy to take this on as a kind of grounding in sociology for what this method is, uh, and it's called a wiki survey. That's one, that's one framing for this kind of system. Wiki surveys are a kind of survey. They allow people to submit uh, any amount of, uh, of information. They, they, uh, they will take 10 votes or 100 votes or 600 votes. We have seen people vote in Polis over 600 times in some cases. Uh, they, will, um, they are collaborative. The, the, the survey itself is created by the people who are taking it. This is significant because it flips the agenda setting mechanism. Public opinion surveys are frequently created by, the, uh, uh, by, by uh, media groups or interest groups or political parties who have an agenda. Even in the case of researchers, they're still going out into the ecosystem have to be trained to avoid bias. This flips that a bit and says, while there is still a prompt, the features on which people will vote, agree and disagree and pass, will be in the words of the population themselves, in the, in the voice of the population themselves, and on the topics that the, the population itself would, would like to discuss. This is significant because many times the opinion, uh, opinion gathering process is not only subject to political manipulation, but it's also constrained to those ideas which power is ready uh, to or willing to discuss or which they're already aware. Neither of those is a constraint in, in the case of a wiki survey. And the last, greedy, it'll take any amount of information, collaborative, it's produced by the people taking it, and also adaptive, which is to say every time someone votes, the machine intelligent aspect of the system uh, is making calculations on how to best use people's time. It is random to avoid bias, but it is also weighted so that if statements have consensus uh, or if they're particularly useful in identifying groups, they are brought forward. Uh, and they are brought forward to be voted on, and the machine system is an agent which is making decisions. It is sensing the situation in, in the opinion space, so to speak, uh, and it is making it is, is actuating, uh, as a, in the robotics term, it's making a decision, making a decision as to what statement to show next. This is a form of machine learning called unsupervised learning, which is to say there is no presumption 
of what clusters exist beforehand, what opinion groups exist. However, machine learning algorithms are capable of clustering in one form that you've most often encountered. This is in recommender engines in, uh, in, in e-commerce websites like Amazon uh, or in preference clusters and taste clusters in, in uh, platforms like Netflix. These are both platforms that use recommender engines, which are a form of collective intelligence to demonstrate that there are, um, that, that if you group people uh, based on their behavior uh, in, in, a, in a system that you can, you can predictably predict the next thing they'll do. Uh, while this is, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons that it is significant that it's open source because our implementation of these kinds of going out into the data, discovering what's there and then clustering are able to be audited by the entire data science, statistical, mathematical uh, uh, community, computer science community, uh, in each country, in any country that the system is being used in. Ev every different organization can confirm for itself that the math is doing what we say it is. The system scales. This is a, an example of a conversation that was run in Germany, uh, which saw nearly 2 million votes cast by 33 million people in a German political party that used it to deliberate internally. This is a, um, this is a, 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 a function of the constraint of the system. That is to say, if we have a constraint that we can only agree, disagree, or uh, pass in response to everyone's statement, we cannot reply directly to anyone else. We can submit a new statement into a giant pool, though, of statements. This provides a specific constraint and allows the system to scale into the millions of votes and tens of thousands of people. This is the German political party that, uh, that, that used it in that case. Polis has been used as an input to deliberative processes, most notably perhaps in the case of, um, oh, well, at, at nation scale in Canada, uh, this, this slide first, uh, in the uh, discussion about visual arts marketplace and the differences between copyrights, uh, between visual art and, uh, and, and, and music. Uh, and the also, um, you know, the, the, the general, um, uh, the general uh, benefit to using deliberative online software uh, is that in an afternoon or in a week, um, a large number of geographically distributed uh, citizens can participate uh, in, in, a, in a deliberative exercise. And these are different sets of assumptions. Can we make meaning at scale across an entire country in real time? The assumption that we can and the assumption that we can build systems that leverage machine intelligence to make meaning of the data that results is an assumption that has motivated our team for a decade now. One of the most impactful studies that we can, uh, we can report out uh, is the case of regulating Uber and online alcohol sales uh, in, and a number of other issues at national scale in Taiwan. There was a process called the Taiwan, which first used scaled up deliberative processes in Polis in the context of facilitated rulemaking that used Cornell Regulation Room, if any of you are familiar with that as a, as a, a deliberative method, uh, and used a kind of map of opinion groups, uh, in this case of Uber drivers and of Uber riders and of taxi drivers to, uh, uh, to bring them into a common space understand what the differences were between those opinion groups and then understand what the commonalities were between those opinion groups. Understand what the commonalities were between those opinion groups. Uh, to, to offer a few examples was that in fact no one between these two opposing groups thought that taxis need to be painted yellow. Perhaps surprising, but it was not a blocking factor. Significantly, even though the taxi organizations were asking for the government to make Uber illegal in the country, no one thought that app-based ride hailing was a bad idea. Everyone thought that UberX drivers should have to carry passenger insurance. In fact, the actual issue under discussion, under debate, was whether or not Uber should have to pay domestic taxes. This, of course, was not the way that the discussion was playing out at national scale. It was 
those Luddite taxi drivers who don't want technological progress. This was, of course, a completely false debate, which we could show. Nothing to do with app-based dispatching. Everything to do with a foreign venture-based company coming in and barnstorming in and not having to pay taxes, being subsidized by the venture industry, and the combination of no taxes and venture subsidy meant that a foreign competitor was going to outcompete a domestic industry. That is the actual issue at play. If we can get there, we can regulate quickly and intelligently. And many of the common points in the Polis conversation ended up becoming law straight away and, and directly. And that was, a, that was a major success for the idea that collective intelligence platforms could be used to, uh, to, 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 um, to produce uh, uh, new, new, new law. Just this past week, the UK government has released a case study from Policy Lab, which is kind of an internal think tank. Uh, they have deployed their own version of the technology, which again means that they control the code, they control the data which has been produced, they control the system and all of the input output, um, and they have, uh, they have released a, a case study which uh, implicated the voting behavior of 2,400 UK civil servants uh, and, uh, and, and, and produced a, a, a case study resulting from, from, from their work. I'm happy to share links uh, afterwards as well uh, to, to any of these. There was a recent Ann Applebaum piece uh, in The Atlantic as well, uh, which, which focused on uh, two solutions, which they had, had referenced. Polis was one of the solutions. This article is available at that, um, at that Google search term. Uh, ours, as well as a, um, a, a colleague and good friend at MIT that develops another system called Cortico. Deb Roy at the Center for Constructive Communication at MIT was another, uh, was another solution in addition to Polis, which was mentioned here. Also, this past month, Twitter, uh, their paper is forthcoming. The blog post is already up. Twitter has released a system that first was used in a small, um, a smaller kind of walled garden uh, approach to, to, to testing a program called Birdwatch. Has now been rolled out globally, uh, and Birdwatch takes the idea and the kind of implication of clustering and then looking for commonalities between the clusters, a metric that in our paper, uh, our methods paper, we call group-informed consensus, uh, and has rolled that out as a method for, um, for, for addressing misinformation uh, on the platform at scale in their own open source implementation that builds on Polis's ideas, and they'll cite that in the forthcoming paper. I'm also happy to share that back with, um, with, with, with Bard uh, when, it when it releases if there's interest. There are a number of limitations to systems of this kind. Um, as the number of comments scale, uh, the, systems can, uh, the systems can falter because you cannot expect people to vote on a million statements, so the system can become overwhelmed in that dimension. So a million people can vote on 100 statements in parallel, but a million, uh, 100 people cannot vote on a million statements, and so there is not symmetry uh, in, the, in the constraints of the system. That is one limitation. Asynchronous voting, which is this, to say that this system can, uh, can, can be used over the course of a week or a month uh, and, and voting can happen, can mean that some stakeholder groups show up early, leave their comments and vote, and then don't come back. Uh, this is also uh, depending on the usage and methodology. Uh, if we use it in real time, everyone's here at the same time. If it's used over time, then there are specific uh, constraints and methodological considerations there. Uh, and because it's a machine intelligence system which is producing clustering, uh, there can also be difficulty integrating results. That is to say, um, do politicians understand the results, even if it's open source? Uh, are they confident in the results which have been delivered by the system? I will end by saying that the significance of open source in this space is worth discussing because method design is core to constitutional republics. The idea that we would be operating on rules and algorithms that we cannot audit as citizens is not acceptable at any level in a democracy. We must have algorithmic transparency in deliberative systems. These systems are here. They are real. They are already having impact across democracies. This will advance, and as a result, we must consider that the values that they encode can either produce a new set of public goods and build public wealth or be sequestered and alienate us from our own democracies. I will uh, we'll now transition to discussion, but as we transition, I would, I would welcome you all to go to this URL, and I'll read it out just in case there's any ambiguity in the characters. 
and engage in a discussion of Professor Cherry's uh, wonderful book that, uh, that she presented in her talk yesterday that was kicked off by the Bard High School and College Program uh, in a, sorry, College and High School Program uh, uh, that, uh, um, uh, of which we have students here in the audience. So this conversation has been started by the students and now you can add your own statements and votes on top of it and build on top of that and we can have an experience which we can discuss as we go. Uh, so the URL is pol.is slash 34 ITMNWAUT. Uh, and I would welcome you to join us there as we uh, vote and then discuss. Thanks so much. I think I've got mine. Do I have mine? Is it on now? You got okay. it. Colin and I spoke about whether we should give you time without us talking for you to do this work, this voting, to think about these various comments. And the conclusion was, I think we can talk while you do it, right? So we'll, we'll chat a little while you <laughs> engage in the in that conversation so we'll have two conversations going on at once but i think it'll work um and i want to ask first since i i chose this as sort of a class discussion question to get discussion moving on professor cherry's book it's a particular type of question and it got me thinking what kinds of questions are best facilitated through polis? Are there some issues that are uh, more ripe for polis analysis than, than others? Uh, and what have you found in terms of where it's been applied, where it's been most successful? Not where, we can talk about where separately. What sorts of issues are most amenable to this work and which may not be? That's a great question. Generally, if the question isn't, uh, isn't actually controversial, like should we have lunch today or not, uh, and, and this extends to all kind of, you know, is the sky blue and uh, kinds of questions, these have too little, we might say dimensionality, these have too much, uh, uh, too, too little uh, disagreement uh, to really be useful. And so to use a specific example of Brexit, if we ask the public, should we leave the EU or not, that is a very broad topic that has many different uh, uh, potential discussion points in it that implicates potentially thousands of issues. If we play that out at a referendum, it's a binary referendum, or we play that out at a deliberative exercise which implicates many thousands of, of it, topics and subtopics, uh, we can kind of use that as a reference. Polis or another deliberative system could be used to uh, to begin at the kind of highest level, should we leave the EU or not? But it is perhaps um, it is perhaps better to move down into some uh, um, you know rather than trying to solve every issue. Right? This is not how perhaps Congress would approach it. When in another deliberative body, if we look at the way that things are broken up into committees, we might say that we're not just taking a vote on a law that's baked. We want to go before the cake is baked, so to speak, and we still have ingredients. Uh, but we also want to make sure that the, the issue has enough, um, enough you know, dimensionality in it that we can have a productive discussion about it. And so we want to go early when there are plenty of, and so not just what, but when. Uh, we want to go early when there's still room to have a discussion and things aren't already assumed. Uh, and we want to go on an issue which has some controversy. Okay, that's very helpful. So it seems like a kind of Goldilocks. It can't be too trivial a question or it, nothing will fly. And if it's too complex, too gigantic of mm -hmm. a question, then maybe it's not well suited to agree, disagree comments. But something in the middle and something that's maybe with practical solutions that could come out of the question. I think that's fair. And so like any survey methodology, there is a bit of survey methodology design implicated but there is room uh, for open-ended questions with polis, and that's really what the kind of savior in that case is. We can say, what, we have a problem, let's discuss it, and actually just leave it at that, given that there's a prompt, and the prompt is open-ended. That's, that's okay. Hmm. I'm thinking about other types of questions that could be possibly addressed, uh, and I'm, I was 
thinking back to an, an oral argument at the Supreme Court that happened a couple weeks ago about the Clean Water Act. And this actually brings back the uh, point about Chevron that Roger made yesterday, which is this question about how much leeway should administrative agencies in the federal government have to set policy and set guidelines. And I was, so the, the case involved, without getting, it, it is in the weeds, I won't get too in the weeds, it's a case asking what the reach of the Clean Water Act is, uh, what counts as a water of the United States, and when, or how far away from a water of the United States um, can the EPA regulate in terms of toxins or other um, bad things that might go onto the land that could seep into our water. The whole purpose of the Clean Water Act is to provide us with clean water. And I was sitting there thinking that, you know, these are very smart judges who are um, trained in the law, but they're being asked to answer a question about what forms of pollution are dangerous to the nation's waters. And as smart as they are in their own realm, that seems like a question for experts, for scientists, for the EPA. Uh, and to say, oh, the water has to be contiguous, or it can be 40 feet away, or if there's a berm in the middle, then you're okay. It all seems sort of random and uh, not well-reasoned. So that's a long wind up to a question <laughs> about, um, how it is that, you know, is, is it necessary for a good polis conversation to proceed and for positive results to come out of it mm -hmm. that the citizenry are informed on that particular subject? How much do they have to know about it and is there a way to gauge knowledge of that issue mm -hmm. before just throwing it out to the public to comment? That's a great question. So I don't believe that mass participation is necessary or general participation is necessary in every deliberative exercise. I think in, in the case of Uber, we can see that we have taxi drivers. Well, they are experts in their lived experience. So are Uber drivers. So are taxi and Uber riders. Uh, and then the general public may show up. But in fact, many of the cases in, in, in regulation, even if it's implicit, even if it's because our current methods of asking for participation are kind of quite poor, and adjacent to that, we have rooms with dozens of industry lawyers who are willing to go through a code line by line. This does implicate participation. The people who show up are interested. We do have methods of, of engaging experts in our democracies, which are not necessarily in code. They may be college friends of people who are regulators. And this is, a, I think, uh, a kind of unspoken but absolutely critical bit of unspoken method of design in the bureaucracy itself. Uh, and, and obviously, Arendt has a, a, a number of things to say about bureaucracy, uh, I think relevant to the conference and, and her thinking perhaps to say that, that we have a lot of implicit expert, expert network behavior in, uh, that, that is not in any kind of code but is in a lot of, uh, of, of just the, the working practices of the, uh, of the bureaucracy. One significant thing about deliberative systems and their history, if we go back to the Cold War, in the Cold War, pre-internet deliberation, there was a method, uh, Murray Turoff, uh, the, and the, it was Rand Corporation innovated something called Delphi Method. This is kind of a pre-internet uh, deliberative methodology. The idea is let's estimate the number of nuclear weapons that the Soviet Union has. They ask some number of scientists in the hundreds or thousands of scientists, give us your estimation. The method works like this. We're going to ask you this question as a prompt. How many do they have? So you're going to say, okay, well, I think they have 1,000, I think they have 50, I think they have 10,000, and you're gonna justify your response. Why do you think that? You take all of those answers, you facsimile them uh, pre-internet, and you mail them back out to everyone. And in subsequent rounds, you ask the experts to converge in a kind of collective intelligence exercise uh, on one answer that everyone is having to justify their answer subsequently, and they're engaged in a series of successive rounds. Now, one of the interesting things about that is that that is the government approaching an expert network with a deliberative exercise before the internet. And I think that there are a number of really fertile examples of governments having the leeway to do this uh, that you can kind of see in, in, the, in, in the case of Uber, this is not an election. This is a regulatory action by an agency. And that regulatory action has all manner of leeway in who they engage and when and how. That's a really good answer. It really helps clear things up. How has the 
the decision reached through the polis process about Uber in Taiwan, how has it played out? Are people happy? Are Uber drivers and taxi drivers profitable and not cursing at each other? Right. I believe that the I believe that the outcome uh, afterwards was that the taxis didn't have to be painted yellow, uh, that everyone needed in rider insurance, and the sticking point was the taxes. And so I believe that Uber did uh, withdrew from the company, uh, withdrew from the country. Uh, as a result of not being willing to agree to the taxation, the local taxation regime in the precedent that, that would have set for other countries that they were in. I believe that was the case. Okay. So a, a pretty happy ending. I think for the taxi drivers, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one feature of Polis that we haven't talked much about yet is the lack of a reply button, which mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. Um, the idea is, I think, that the replies on Facebook, on Twitter, are the source of a lot of the rage and the virality and um, and the hatred and mm -hmm. the trolling that happen. So on the comments that you're now reading and then adding, all you do is vote, is, is say agree or disagree, and then add your own comment separately. But there's no there are no threads, there are no replies to replies, there's no actual electronic discussion going on. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about a couple dimensions of that decision not to put a reply button in. One is, is it a conversation, really? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's called a conversation on Polis, but is it a conversation if no one is actually responding in words mm -hmm. to each other's comments? Mm -hmm. And second, if the premise is correct that adding a reply button would ruin the whole project because everyone would just be jumping down each other's throats and it would turn into Twitter, is that, uh, is that a sobering lesson about maybe the, the, the impossibility of reasoned discussion without it devolving into terrible forms of discussion? Well, I think one of the interesting bits perhaps in mechanism design, which is to say building a website for people to talk to each other. When I say mechanism design, we'll just say that too. The, the number of lurkers, that is to say people who show up on a social media platform and read and don't write, they might like or they might retweet. That's a different interaction that they can have. Most people do not write. Most of the content is created by very few of the people. And so when we, dis when we discuss what is and is not a conversation on Twitter, that, that decision that the primary way of driving a conversation is by writing something means that you have to either have an anonymous account if you first you have to think of a statement that's that's actually a high tax activity you have to summarize what came before add a new thought that's 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 a lot of calories liking is almost no calories right uh in, glu in, in glucose spent uh and so you know the the uh the but, idea but the reward is high if someone likes your post that's right that's right plenty of dopamine on that end of it yeah so the the idea with restricting replies also is to say lurking is, the, the primary action is to engage 100% of the people that are, that are here. The, pro, the secondary action is the high tax action. And so from a design standpoint, it, it, it's intended to capture, as we saw, you know, potentially tens of thousands or millions of votes from, from, from participants. Uh, and we should actually see how many votes we've produced now. We can, uh, uh, I can maybe briefly summarize the conversation as well. That might this, be a good time to do that. This would be a great time to do that. Okay, so I'll briefly say that, so this is the conversation. I took a screenshot before anyone in this room participated. This was just the students. So let's take a look just briefly at the output. What you'll see is you'll see some shaded areas. These are, um, you can think of this as a, a, a group of people who voted similarly to each other, internally consistently, across many issues. So group A voted together on many issues and distinct and separately from the other groups. So in this case, group A, which is four people, four of the students, all of them agreed on statement nine, that anger is a negative emotion. Group B and C disagreed. If we look at another statement, we can see that group C, all of them agreed on Comment 16, in my opinion, anger or rage is the cure for a lot of the problems in the world. I also think violence goes along with that. This differentiates group C from the other groups. However, we can see that comment 10, statement 10, anger is productive, 
had no disagreement. All of the groups, despite their agreements on other topics, agreed on this issue. This idea is, in our, in our methods paper, uh, we, we term this group-informed group consensus. That is to say, whether there's large groups or small groups, we identify different worldviews. If there are different ways of voting consistently, can we find certain statements which bridge them? And this idea of bridging with statements uh, is significant to finding places where we can start a conversation. So Polis helps clarify points of disagreement in putting people in these different shaded categories, mm -hmm. and it shows where the bridges might lie between them. Yes, that's right. Shall we proceed to see how the voting has evolved with more people taking part in the discussion? Yes, I realize that, let's see. Okay, so I can see the clusters, and you can see the clusters on your devices. They are not going to appear here, though. And so we'll have to just look at our own devices for that. So I'm just going to briefly take a look. Yeah, actually, if you want, if we can, we can look together. OK, we'll give everyone just a moment to continue to vote as well. So just to give you a little background on the seated statements, so I typed in before my students um, convened last week, I typed in 14 or 15 statements, some of them drawn from Professor Cherry's book, some of them, I was trying to think who is someone who has said kind of the opposite, and I thought Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a great example of someone who says, you know, her mother told her that uh, patience is the way to make change in the world, showing resentment, showing anger, will never persuade anyone. And she had a particular uh, context behind that as, as a woman who was bringing cases to the Supreme Court to try to get them to uh, look at the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment as an amendment that's not just about race but about gender. And she was there speaking to nine men. For She built this slow, steady, <laughs> If any of you have followed her, I'm sure many of you, most of you have followed her career. Um, before she was a justice, as a lawyer, she uh, devoted herself to making constitutional change through these quiet and not rage-filled uh, types of presentations to the justices, and also by appealing to their interests, by showing how gender inequality hurts men sometimes just as much as women. So I took some comments from her as alternative takes on anger and rage to those of Professor Cherry and thought that that would be a good way to have a balance, some sort of balance between um, the case for rage and the case for moderating one's rage or not showing any rage at all. Mm -hmm. And then students added their own. Um, I don't think, I don't think as you, scroll through the comments, you don't know if they were seeded comments or if they were added later by participants, right? You might be able to tell based on the number. Uh, so if the number was very high or past like at least 29, uh, so I believe statement 30 and on would be. Okay, so that's your clue. Yeah. So can we analyze what's going on here and then yeah, see so what you I think? Yeah, so I believe there were 29 statements before and there are 47 now. And so that's, um, you know, that's uh, some statements that have been submitted by the group here as well. Uh, and then perhaps I'll point out, uh, if we click on group B and we click on statement 14, we can see rage, even good rage, should generally be avoided to prevent the spread of destructive forms of rage among racists and others who propagate injustice. And so group B uh, fully, fully disagreed with this. There was no one in group B who, who, um, uh, uh, who, agreed with, uh, who agreed with this. On the other hand, let me see if I can find one for group, um, for group A. So group A was more likely to agree with the statement, violence is rarely a positive solution, which is statement 30. Uh, and let me see if I can find one that's later. Uh, I'm not sure that I can because it's a, it's a PowerPoint. And so I, I think, I apologize, but you'll have to look on your device and I can say the number of the statement. Ah, uh, ha. Oh. Thank you. 
Thank you a ton. The crack tech team in the back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Big tech. <laughs> Thanks for coming through for us. Yes, so, so we can see group B, uh, group B in this case disagrees with statement 14 uh, about whether raid should always be avoided. Uh, and we can see that... Oh, and I'll just add bef before you flip. 14, I, was, I typed that in this room yesterday during the discussion of the case for rage uh, uh -huh. as uh, something that most people will seem to disagree with in the room. <laughs> um, and even as I was typing it, I was disagreeing with it. But it seemed to be a good way to gauge what people think about the alternative take to Professor Cherry's central premise. And then... On the other hand, I, if, if you would click majority opinion and then number 31. So this was a statement that was submitted by someone uh, in the room during, during the, the talk today. Tightrope, risk reward issue. There is absolutely a place for rage in moments of explicit, pending, and obvious harm. And despite disagreement on the other issue, there is agreement between the two groups on this. And what might seem like a subtly different phrasing what might seem like a contradiction there is universal agreement on between the groups and that that is that is that is the 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 subtlety with which we have seen across many conversations across many contexts across many countries in Bhutan and Pakistan and East Timor and also the UK and Canada and New Zealand that the case that when someone in the someone in the crowd has a phrasing has an angle by which they understand, I, I know what people really think here, and th that is a bit of a game. There is a bit of a game to find that right. statement. So there's an incentive to be the one who writes the very popular statement that bridges I have previously been, disagreeing groups. I have been in a room with an individual who was the person who submitted that statement in a national scale conversation, and he was very excited. So I, yeah. think, I think, anecdotally, yes. And this is all anonymous, but whoever wrote number 31 must be feeling pretty good right now. <laughs> right? That's much better than a like on Facebook. Oh, All right, okay. well, here we go. No <laughs> longer anonymous. But I want to analyze the, the wording of it and why it's such an um, attractive statement. There is a sense of certainty to it. There is, you know, the word absolutely. There is absolutely a place, no doubt in mm -hmm. anyone's mind, that there's a place for rage in what sorts of moments? In moments of explicit pending or obvious harm. So that, that could be a very narrow range of moments, mm -hmm. right? They could be rare, quite rare. Mm -hmm. But I think it attracted, aside from the, the style, which is lovely, I think it attracted a lot of votes because of that certainty about something narrow. So it's still, I think, narrow disagreement, a narrow agreement, despite the fact that mm -hmm. everyone seems to agree with, with that statement. I don't know if that made sense. Well, to go back to a methods design standpoint, hopefully this demonstrates the idea that we, we can have many issues, many, many ideas submitted simultaneously. We can have lots of parallelized voting. That is to say, everyone is voting at the same time. Everyone is submitting issues at the same time, or statements. Uh, and the result of that is that we can quickly identify consensus. We don't have to have everyone speak one at a time and everyone listen and then everyone spe someone speak. That takes, that, that's, that's not in parallel, that's serial. And so, you know, frequently in town meetings, we have that kind of a, a constraint as well. And so to the, to the idea of whether this is a conversation or not, I believe it's a map. And if we understand a map, if we understand a, a topology, a landscape, you know, to, mathematically speaking, if we start from that assumption, we can have a different kind of discussion when we do engage in dialogue afterwards. Which is perhaps one way to consider what these platforms might be used for in a democratic system, is to say that they might be inputs to existing or even novel uh, democratic uh, uh, kind of structures or organs or, or processes. Well, that's a helpful answer to the question that I, I started with about um, whether this is just a series of opinions being registered or if it can promote dialogue um, and be the basis of a more informed discussion where people already kind of have the sense of, mm -hmm. the, of, the, of the range of opinions on a certain question. Mm -hmm. And to the degree to which Twitter has now adopted the same methodology, the way that it works in Twitter is that if a comment is flagged as misinformation, step one, 
it will be entered into a program whereby Twitter can sample randomly from all of Twitter, step two. Then those people who have been sampled to discuss that particular tweet which had been proposed as misinformation, maybe by someone, maybe by a faction, maybe, maybe, maybe not correctly, can add labels or annotations to it, step three, which are then voted on in this same manner on the Twitter platform and Birdwatch by that population, step four. The statements which are like this, which are group informed consensus, are identified, step five, and then step six, those are added now underneath of a tweet. So if you see a tweet that has Birdwatch underneath of it, this was the process that you've engaged with today, which has produced it. Maybe one more question and then we'll get to audience questions. Um, one of the features of Polis that you don't have access to is the moderate function. So the people who create conversations can see various pieces of data about them and they can also moderate them. They can reject comments. They can add more comments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking, I was thinking about the word moderate and the fact that I'm a moderator mm -hmm. here. It's sort of a funny um, term. And <laughs> you know, I, the, the idea of moderate is to eliminate extremes. And I don't know if I'll have that job, that task really for the rest of our, our session. But when one moderates a discussion like this, is there, is there some worry that in, um, in the hands of someone who is not seeking the true democratic view on a question that they could moderate out certain comments that are too popular or that to, 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 to try to um, steer the conversation toward an outcome that the conversation starter would like to see? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, and so the Polis conversation that we're having today is sandboxed and isolated from every other conversation in the sense that you have, um, you, you, you have control of it. You can, you can prevent certain statements from being added, uh, but you can't do that for other conversations. And so that means that the moderators, the, the ability of citizens to find trusted moderators uh, who are aligned. For instance, I've seen, I have seen organizations do exactly what you said, and I've seen groups of journalists that, uh, you know, create guide, internal guidelines for their newspaper to use polls, which have had 11 people in a room on a Zoom call thinking through the minutia of what comment would be moderated and when and why. And so I think that from a methodological standpoint, um, there must be a, a rubric for, for that, which is and having the data be open data afterwards is, is also implicated there. Can people see during or afterwards which statements have been allowed or not allowed? Can they confront the moderator during the conversation or not? Ultimately though, I think that all of that is just booster rockets for uh, whatever the ultimate system is. We just need to get case studies that are, there will be many good case studies and there will be many problematic case studies because the tool is just a tool. It is, it is still subject to whatever process and political process it gets ingested into. And since it's open source, we have limited control now at this point as to where that is. Uh, you know, it's been ingested into the, into the, the uh, poli by policy lab into the UK government to be used as civil servants. I expect very responsibly by them. Uh, but as tool builders, we, we have certain constraints that uh, we can operate under. Uh, and then those who will use the tool will have others. Um, but I think that the best uh, result would be for citizens to be able to vote with their feet. Okay. A great final word before we get to questions. Who has something you'd like to raise? Let's start with the student in the back. Bella. Um, this is out. Good. You've got it. Um, so I guess something that caught my eye was that there's no gray area for when you agree or disagree. Uh, I'm like an avid, like, uh, what is it called, survey person or like personality type person, and they often have choices to strongly agree, agree, in the middle, mm. and then vice versa for the disagree. Mm. And I was wondering if that was purposeful for you to have that black and white, um, or maybe do you want to implement that? I don't know, uh, but yeah. Great question. We did decide early on not to use a Likert scale. Uh, that decision it was intended so that we could produce a binary matrix, which is the one, zero, negative one. Um, but sparse binary matrix is the first input to, the, uh, uh, to, to all the subsequent algorithms. 
However, yes, we are in the process of adding more signals, uh, and the way that we'll the way that the way that we're approaching that is, in fact, on an issue on our GitHub, and it's being discussed openly. And so if you'd like to read that and respond online, along with the community of data scientists that's working on it, you, you can. And so I'll, I'll let you know where afterwards. Great question. Maybe we'll, okay. Jaden, go ahead, and then we'll, let, we'll give an adult a chance for once. Uh, so the 2016 election polls, um, you know, they predicted a sweeping victory for Hillary, but, you know, as we all know, that was drastically incorrect and inaccurate. Um, so personally, I think that part of the reason why that was the case um, was part was because you know first of all the strict prompts that uh, wiki polls usually have, and also um, non-response bias. Uh, you know because Trump voters may have you know this anti-institutional feelings. Um, I agree on non-response bias. I, I agree. Yeah. And it also, and I think it also made them unwilling to uh, respond to polls conducted um, to the mainstream media by the mainstream media. Um, so my question was, uh, do you think that polls can reduce this like reluctance to uh, you know sh sh for them to share their opinions and um, you know so that we can more accurately accurately predict our election results and prevent the mass false hope and unforeseen surprises that happened in 2016. My hope for deliberative systems, uh, machine intelligent deliberative systems, is that instead of the application of polling at the very end of a process that is completely captured, and we're in a binary vote horse race situation based on party platforms that have been baked without much public input, based on, you know, and back and back and back, that we're engaging the public in the formation of the agenda and in the discussion of direction and goals and values and things like that. And so my answer is that we can change categorically the place in which we engage people. And the fact that we engage them so late, I believe is part of the non-response bias problem. People are making a rational decision, I think, in hanging up the phone or not picking it up in the first place. They don't have to participate in a horse race with their phone ringing off the hook in a swing state. They don't have to do that. They're not being paid to. They're just being hounded. Professor Mehta. Feel free to hand out mics to anyone with hands up and we can just proceed that way. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, Colin, uh, one of the things uh, I think is a big difference between democracies and authoritarian regimes uh, is that democracies, conversations or public policy mm -hmm. in democracies is often constrained by what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is there some mechanism uh, whereby this uh, polis uh, has a sense of the past, uh, since this is a kind of you know, very recent uh, uh, thing. And the reason I ask this question is, uh, uh, is I think uh, ordinary conversations are constrained by the past. So if somebody said, uh, you know, has your view changed? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, six days ago, you said this. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what has led you to change your mm -hmm. view? Does your, uh, uh, is it an application or device? Yeah, we could say, we could say deliberative system yeah. or yeah. Sy system. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the, can it accommodate? That's a wonderful question. So I think there are, there are a few parts to it, and I would like to answer each in, in, in order. First, I'll say that could polis be run in rounds where you have a conversation and then you add to it and you add to it and you come back to it and you perhaps, and the answer is yes, you could start a, a new conversation with the same statements. You could, um, you could run a second conversation later. You could fundamentally change the, the design of the system and add to it to allow, um, to allow changing votes. 
uh, one of the reasons that we have not allowed changing votes is that we wanted the system to not be quite so stressful. So in other words, if I ask you to vote on 47 things, and then I say you can change your mind on any of them, suddenly we have a very different experience where I'm having to give you a an interface to go back through all of your votes, reconsider them in light of, the, of new votes. And so one challenge there is that there's uh, an added bit of stress and, and the amount that you have to keep in your mind. Uh, there's a desire with this system to, not, to, dec to allow the individual to consider deeply one statement and then vote and move on. And if there are perhaps uh, changes uh, subsequently, uh, there are, um, there is not presently in the system uh, a way to change your vote. But this has been discussed quite a bit over time, and I could certainly see systems or variants of the system that did allow that. And so one way that that could be implemented is in changing a vote from an agree to a, 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 a disagree. That is one way. So, but this, everything you're saying... Uh, yeah, you're good. Everything you're saying uh, is about the future. Mm -hmm. Is there any way you can acknowledge the past? Because... Policies are often constrained right. by the past. Uh, right. And, you know, you couldn't uh, have done these tests. Uh, right. You couldn't have done this uh, process, whatever you call it. Uh, right. Uh, to people sitting in, you know, in, in 1945. Right. Uh, right. So is there any way that this system can acknowledge uh, the past? Because some policies are... It's yes, it's absolutely. Th this is a very yeah. this is a very important and deep question, and I think one of the I think one of one of the the responses uh, is dependent on whether we consider that machine intelligent deliberative systems will be a thin slice. They'll they'll you'll have a, a, a process, and then this will will produce a map, and then that map will be interpretable by other steps, and it, and then there's policymakers, and there's there's delegates perhaps from each of these groups that are going into the process, or there's a citizen assembly that if it's a thin slice, that it does not bear the responsibility for what you describe. And it just has a specific job. And, and in part, as technologists, part of our intention in creating new political technology is just to demonstrate that even just using it as a thin slice is, is even feasible at all. But I think that if we extend this to consider that we might engage, we might begin to eat backwards and eat forwards to other part of the processes and integrate uh, parts of uh, in, into a broader system which might produce law, uh, that it becomes very important that we're able to look backwards towards previous um, uh, uh, previous dialogue and discourse and perspective and constraints, um, and in some cases, expert knowledge uh, is another great example of that. Uh, then I think those produce different organs and potentially steps of these these processes that I do personally expect that as we get each of those sections right, we will then begin to kind of glue them together. But I think that it's likely that each of these will be produced in a slice on its own and then be assembled into something greater. That's a, a wonderful question. Has there ever been thought to the idea that maybe before participating in, uh, in a particular poll that participants would need to read a position paper or two on one issue? 100%, yes. Or read Maisha Cherry's book or at least he a chapter of it? Yes, in past uh, discussions and in present discussions at national scale in New Zealand uh, that are run with their large media organizations and uh, the government itself with professional facilitators uh, that we've been working with there since 2016, this is always the case. They're producing summaris summarizing uh, readings which are available uh, and someone can come in and just start, re just start, someone can come in and just start going and voting or on their way through they have access to all sorts of good information, summarized information, and, and you know, we see these sometimes uh, on ballot initiatives. There are processes in the United States where ballots will come with some background information or media will produce, you know, voting guides and things like that. And I think that, you know, for this to really be good, for, you know, we, we, this, this slice can exist and it implies maybe a whole bunch of other stuff, both before it and after it. And I think New Zealand is one of the, that group, is re it's really exciting. I have a number of case studies that I could share, you know, um, out afterwards with, via links as well if there's interest. That sounds very rich because just taken as it is, the comments could just be a stream of claims with sure. no warrants, no reason giving, yes, just right. here's my view, you agree right. or disagree. Right. Yes. Okay, who has the mic? Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is, uh, the problem or the, the withdrawal of democracy that now we face is happens in some of the reasons are that uh, the participation, that the moderate people, the people that ha hold in the moderate um, 
v- political view on social views. views are mm-hmm. they they are shrinking and the extreme uh, minds just active that's true in voting and that's true on social media so how your platform would be different from the social media platform to not attract or just give the place the voice to the extremes uh, extremes people again Mm -hmm. so how do you make sure that your platform being used to um bring back the inclusion to all people and to uh just not work toward reducing uh, reason again Mm -hmm. thank you yeah that's a one that's a wonderful question i think that so if, if we consider let's take let's take this uh, this statement, anger is a negative emotion, and I'll answer your question in the most concrete way that I can from how the system actually functions first, and then perhaps go more broadly to uh, democratic design. From a systems perspective, the system does not consider that extremism is undesirable or really even identifiable separately from differences. Is it an extreme opinion that only four people think one way and the rest of the conversation agrees with them? They're in the minority. Um, We have seen what might be considered an extreme opinion on the other hand, uh, in, in other cases, I'll take a conversation from New Zealand. They had a conversation uh, on housing and affordable housing. Well, there were some choice words, there were some choice words for landlords. Some rather extreme statements. And it turned out that everyone thought that. So I think if we consider the content of the statement in the context of consensus or the lack of consensus relative to the content we might come to a different assessment of what we consider an extreme statement. That is one thing that I've come to think building these tools. Uh, and if, if, if we, I'm happy to pick that point up over lunch as well because I think it's a particularly, intru- I think we could talk for an hour just about what we consider extremism uh, in, in, in online discourse and in, in, uh, in, in media. Because to say that the, uh, to say that Malcolm X was extreme to say that he was representative, I, I think that we, we have to understand r- representation in the context of the people who are being represented in a democracy who may hold markedly different views. And I don't particularly think it's safe to make presumptions or assessments about whether the content is extreme or whether just because something is held by a, a, a potentially minority viewpoint uh, or by a majority viewpoint. Uh, is, is necessarily extremism. I think that that label um, is likely to be revisited in a dramatic fashion in the next generation of, of both tooling and systems. Uh, and then I, I'm happy to, I, I think we could talk for an hour about that. And so I, I, I'll stop maybe on a dramatic pause. Okay. Uh, hi, also, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my background is in deliberative democracy and thinking about um, using this. My thesis was based on this. So I'm in trouble. Here. <laughs> very, very interested. So when I first uh, read your statement, the uh, efficiency, gathering, and making meaning of perspectives at scale by machine learning, I was very um, pessimistic about that statement because I feel <laughs> that uh, deliberative democracy is a meaningful inefficiency. It allows, it gives the space that that inefficiency is meaningful for people to make sense, to have the space to understand, empathize, and create almost like a a collective paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. However, I think you did a great job of presenting this because I think that now I can see this as a tool to be able to be able to aggregate different ideas and then have discussions based around those and make sense in those types of discussions Mm -hmm. that are a really meaningful way. But I guess my, my big question for you is how do you find the distinction between using this tool to be used for um, like a learning space to be able to understand more deeply rather than it being a polling tool that then can be manipulated in a way to uh, 
to generate a mm -hmm. democratic justification for something that is uninformed. And I think that's what we've been talking mm -hmm. a lot about mm -hmm. in this discussion is mm -hmm. kind of uninformed ways that we, we put out things on social media. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the, the democratic or the deliberative democracy space really promotes this space of sharing and, and getting on the same level and agreeing maybe on a consensus with somebody who has a very different view. So I guess I'm just wondering, how do you navigate that space in trying to use this tool mm -hmm. to promote that discussion and not further perpetuate these uh, polarities? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. One of the concrete things that I can say is uh, that we've had for the past decade uh, a strategy of guiding the adoption of the technology quietly into spaces by people who we thought would use it well. And that is uh, um, technologies are neutral in a sense. Hammer can build a home. You can hit someone with a hammer. I mean that in the truest sense. It's a, it's a, you can it's a, objectify it. It's a, it's it's we ha have to consider the context. But I don't think that. I, I don't think that it's that it's neutral where we aim the tools. I have spent a lot of time and energy to frame the usage of this tool as a tool that is for deliberative democracy. And I think that to the degree to which we have licensed it in AGPL v3 format, it is significant that even if a major company, for instance, picks it up, any advancement they make to the tool still contributes to public wealth or they're legally liable, right? They can't close source it as a result of, the, uh, as a result of that. So those are two things that are possible to do. You can license it in a way that keeps improvements in the commons first, and you can guide it and shape the adoption of it intentionally. And while those are both, one of them is easier than the other. <laughs> Uh, one of them is something you do on day one, and then one of them is something you continually do. I think that uh, that's one specific answer. I think that your, um, and I've, I've got to go backwards now um, into, well, I think part of that went to your initial Greek, you know, what you were saying about, you know, does it become knowledge? Uh, you know, but, and, but I, I'll say that I really appreciate, uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, thank you for reading, um, and thank you for, uh, and thank you for being open to changing your mind as well. I, I think that, that what you describe and the way that you describe feeling one way and feeling another is something that I feel as a tension uh, that if, okay, well, if we're going to make certain assumptions about constraints that we're going to allow a soccer stadium-sized group of people to communicate with each other, we're going to have to anticipate some, you know, some, uh, some thrown sodas, right? Um, that, that we need some constraints. Uh, and on the other hand, on the other hand, we potentially want to, like in V-Taiwan, um, punt to deliberative processes where, for instance, perhaps uh, a member of each group or three members from, uh, from each cluster that's been identified uh, who are representatives of that could go engage in some subsequent process. Uh, the, it's not to say that it's the, only, um, it's the only step. And so I think that they're not necessarily opposed, but the tension between them and the compromises we make, we're likely to make different compromises at each step uh, in these deliberative processes. I also don't think that with different compromises and potentially with an enormous amount more investment of time uh, on the side of the citizens that we couldn't build a different set of tools that, that have quite different goals. And I will say that for the amount of time that we spend thinking about politics and following politics and, and, and you know, time that we spend on the horse race, if we were able to engage more meaningfully, especially in things that we're particularly knowledgeable about, nurses and healthcare discussions, things like this, right? Uber drivers in, del in deliberative dialogues. I think that the idea that someone might spend 20 or 30 hours within deliberative systems over the course of a year is not, would not be at all surprising. Uh, and I think is, is, is actually potentially exciting um, because people might make different calculuses in their own life about where and how they spend time um, engaging in participatory processes. 